Wow. What an honor. Um, before I tell my story today, and it's going to be a story. I don't lecture. I don't give talks. It's going to be a story. Before I tell that story, I want to start with a quote that I learned by working in Southern Africa. And I'm not going to try to pronounce it closer. But loosely, the proverb means people are people through other people. So I never present myself without thanking and acknowledging the people who made me who I am. Um, I always start with my family for their love and support. They won't let me be in the photographs anymore. This is an old one. But in particular, I want to thank my mother and father as a biologist. I literally wouldn't be here without them. I want to thank them for 50 years of support. I want to thank my wife, Catherine Kim, for 30 years of love and support, and my two children, Tyler and Cassina. I want to thank all of the funding sources. It, it takes money to, to do work and to, to get science done. And I also want to disclose that I have been paid by the chemical manufacturers for the work that I do, um, but not anymore. They say, if you're not pissing somebody off, maybe you're not doing anything important. Based on the response of the industry, I'm a pretty important guy. <laughs> I want to thank all of the students that I've worked with over the years. This isn't all of them, but the ones that have worked on the things that I'll talk to you about today. Everybody in blue was an undergraduate. I had a wonderful experience as an undergraduate myself. And I've been doing my best to try to give that back. This is my current laboratory. Again, the undergraduates are in blue. And, and again, an older picture, but this is my lab. I want to thank them. I've learned so much from the diversity of people that I've been able to work with. And in particular, the students who actually have, have come from families that work in the agricultural industry. And finally, I want to dedicate this to my grandmother, who, in addition to passing on her love of education to me, and allowing me to catch frogs in her backyard when I was a little kid, she taught me something very important, that if you want to get a point across, don't preach, don't teach, don't lecture, just tell a good story. And I want to tell you a story today about a little boy who likes frogs. My mom says this was my favorite book when I was a kid. I don't remember the book, but I've been trying to answer this question for all of my life. And this book and this question have took me to places that I never would have guessed I would get to go. One, it took me to college. I grew up in a community where I thought, as a young black man, I had to learn how to play a sport to go to college. I didn't know you could go to college just because you liked frogs. <laughs> I got to go to Harvard, and, and I was originally pre-med because I didn't know what a little boy who likes frogs did after they got out of college. But this guy, Bruce Waldman, my professor who took me under his wing, who treated me like a graduate student, taught me that I could just continue loving frogs, a little boy who likes frogs. I became very interested in Reproduction, well, maybe every undergraduate is, but <laughs> in the professional sense, I became interested in reproduction and environmental control of reproduction and those hormones that control that reproduction. And then a weird thing happened. My frogs got me to Berkeley. My frogs got me into a PhD program. My frogs got me a job at Berkeley. They took me to places that I didn't think I would be able to go. And then a very weird thing happened. I filed a patent working with frogs to examine how compounds in the environment affect hormones and affect frog development. And it completely took me into places I didn't expect to go. Because the university owns your intellectual property, I was asked to show how I was going to make money on this patent. And to make money on this patent, I got asked by a company called Novartis, the largest chemical company in the world, to figure out with my frogs if atrazine was a so-called endocrine disruptor. It's an herbicide. It's the most common pesticide used in the world, the most common contaminant of drinking water in the world. And we studied African clawed frogs and how they respond to atrazine. And now I'm going to sum up 20 years in about two minutes. We show that if these guys are exposed to atrazine, they develop as hermaphrodites with multiple gonads, multiple testes, multiple ovaries. One pair will get you in enough trouble, so try, try dealing with that. We later found out after about eight years of work, that's why it takes about 200 students, that some of the individual genetic males that are exposed completely turn into females. They lay eggs, or as far as we can tell, except that we have the genetics, they're females. And we proposed a hypothesis that what happened was 
Normally, the testis should make testosterone in a male. Who, who knows the word, what the word testosterone means? It's a portmanteau. You know what a portmanteau is? I, I learned this word at age 49. It's when you stick two words together. Like smoke and fog, you get smog. Twist and jerk, you get twerk. Testosterone, <laughs> just a few examples. Testosterone literally means testicular hormone. You should make that if you're a male. So if you're exposed to atrazine, we propose that it turns on aromatase, which causes testosterone to turn into estrogen, the female hormone, and that's what we propose was demasculinizing and feminizing our frogs. Well, then I thought, because I'm a little boy who likes frogs, I like to be outside and we're doing this lab work, and I thought maybe it's a laboratory artifact. We did these studies across the United States and we did studies in Africa, and we found that this was a real phenomenon that occurred in the wild when animals were exposed and maybe a contributing factor to the global amphibian decline. 70% of all amphibian species are in danger and in some decline. We worked in places like this in Africa, Lake Nabugabu, and I started to wonder, is it just frogs? If the water running off of this crop here in Uganda is affecting frogs, what about the fish? What about the other animals that come to drink from this water? What about the people? that are using this water as their drinking water, as their cooking water. What about in my own village? I live somewhere there in the hills. But my water comes, and we were looking at atrazine at levels that are 30 times lower than what's allowed in your drinking water. And we all know from examples of, for example, Flint, Michigan, that we aren't necessarily protected by that agency that says that they protect us. So I got interested in whether or not there was a relationship. I call this from silent spring to silent night because in much the same way that Rachel Carson taught that the death of birds and the role of pesticides and other chemicals we were putting in the environment and our silent spring was a warning to us, maybe our silent night and the loss of amphibian diversity was also a warning to us. A colleague of mine wrote, in ecoepidemiology, the occurrence of an association of more than one species and species population is very strong evidence for causation. And so I wanted to know, we had examined more than one species of frog, but I wanted to know, could our work be extended to fish, to reptiles, to birds, to mammals? I can't do all that on my own, so I reached out to collaborators. And, and we discovered, 22 of us, from 12 different countries, from four different continents, that we were finding the same things. So for example, you're looking at, on the left, a frog testis under the microscope full of sperm. When they're exposed to atrazine, there's no sperm. The testis are empty. They're infertile. Another person showed this in Belgium in fish. Another individual showed this in reptiles down in Argentina, a couple. Another individual both in Croatia and in Nigeria showed the same thing happens in rats. Sperm in the testis, on the right, given matrazine, no sperm. And a colleague in Pakistan showed the same thing in birds. So this was a phenomenon that we had discovered that was happening across vertebrate classes. What's more is if you look at humans, another colleague of mine showed that if you compare, if you look at the atrazine levels in the urine of men, there's a significant correlation between infertility, low sperm count, and atrazine in your urine, in your body. In fact, the red bar on average shows that these guys are urinating out the same amount of atrazine that it takes for us to chemically castrate a frog, but that's in their bodies. Another colleague showed that if I mash the data down, these are the atrazine levels in the urine of men who work in the fields in California, and if I drop it down again, these are the atrazine levels of men who apply atrazine in California. Men who apply atrazine have 2,400 parts per billion atrazine in their urine. That's 24,000 times the amount of atrazine that we use in my laboratory to chemically castrate frogs and fish. That's 24,000 times the atrazine that we know is associated with low sperm count and low fertility in men living in Columbia, Missouri. One of, these guys, one of these guys could pee in a bucket, and I could use the atrazine in their urine to chemically castrate and feminize 24,000 buckets of 30 tadpoles each after diluting it 24,000 times. So then I became a little boy who likes frogs, introduced to what I call some grown-up words, and one of those is environmental justice or environmental racism, because you know who those farmers are that have those high levels of atrazine. We know little about their reproductive function. And not only are they exposed to atrazine, they're exposed to chemicals like chlorpicrin, which was developed as a nerve gas in World War II. They're exposed to chemicals like 2,4-D, which is a component of Agent Orange, and now we spray it on our food. And the individuals who are working with those compounds. 
What's more is excess estrogen is problematic, and humans is associated with mammary cancer and prostate cancer. In their own factory, they show there's an 8.4% fourfold increase in prostate cancer in men working in their factory bagging atrazine in a community that's 80% African American. And there's that 8.4-fold increase. In humans, it's also associated with breast cancer. Women whose well waters contaminated with, breast can with atrazine are more likely to get breast cancer. And it's not just a correlation, because in their own laboratories, if they give atrazine to rats, you see an increased incidence of breast cancer. So I continued to think about the environmental justice issues. I became aware of the fact of the following. Making excess estrogen, as atrazine induces, is not good for several reasons. The number one cancer in women is breast cancer. It's driven by estrogen and it's driven by the expression of aromatase and the local production of estrogen that causes your damaged cells to grow and to turn into tumors. In fact, the number one treatment for breast cancer right now is a chemical called letrozole, pharmaceutical, that knocks out aromatase and decreases estrogen so your damaged cells don't turn into breast cancer cells, don't turn into tumors. Yet you've got a battle with the number one chemical in drinking water that does exactly the opposite, that induces aromatase, increases estrogen, and is associated with breast cancer and induces it in rats. I discovered that Novartis Oncology offers treatments for breast cancer. In the year 2000, the same company that was making the breast cancer treatment was selling the atrazine. The same company that was selling 80 million pounds of atrazine, which induces aromatase, was selling letrozole to block aromatase. You can imagine how happy they were that I pointed that out. I'm just a little boy who likes frogs. I became aware of the following. These are the top 13 cancers that you're going to get in the United States. In red now, 11 of the 13 are the ones that you're more likely to get if you're African-American. If you're African-American, you're more likely to die from 13 out of 13. Is this biological? It's genetic? Could be. But we wouldn't know. Because with the exception of HeLa, the cancer cell lines that we use in breast cancer and other cancer studies don't come from black, don't come from Latinx. So even if we find the cure, Coleman, it may be irrelevant to the people who are more likely to get and more likely to die. We also know that if you're a minority, if you're a low income, you're if you're an immigrant, you're more likely to live in a community where you're exposed to chemicals that we know are associated with these adverse health outcomes. So when the doctor tells you you're more likely to get cancer if somebody else in your family has cancer, they're not telling you you got bad genes, they're telling you you've been exposed to the same crap as the rest of your family. I became, as a little boy who liked frogs, interested in whether or not my love of these animals, these aquatic animals, were really telling me something about these. Because we start out in water, we need testosterone, estrogen, thyroid hormone, the same hormones that my frogs need. And we now know that before you were born, before your children will be born, they will be exposed to over 300 synthetic chemicals, most of which we have no idea what they do. We do know that atrazine causes prostate and mammary cancer in rats, which we use as a proxy for us. We do know that atrazine causes immune failure in rats. We do know that atrazine causes neural damage when rats are exposed in utero, and the studies that affected me the most were the following. The EPA showed that rats exposed to atrazine are more likely to have abortion. They showed that if those rats that don't abort, the daughters are more likely to be born with prostate disease. If those rats that don't abort, the sons are more likely to be born with prostate disease. The daughters are more likely to be born with mammary problems that don't allow them to feed their offspring properly. This affected me because I realized, as I'm sure you do, that rat on the bottom never saw atrazine. The rat on the bottom was affected by atrazine that its grandmother was exposed to. The rat on the bottom never saw atrazine. The rat on the bottom was affected by atrazine that its grandmother was exposed to. So when I think about, as a little boy who likes frogs, my little girl, she's 22 now, my son, that my grandchildren, that your grandchildren, could be affected by chemicals that we're using today and made me realize that I have a much bigger responsibility than just a little boy who likes frogs, a much bigger responsibility as a person. 
And it's already shown that there's a correlation. The more atrazine, if you are pregnant doing peak atrazine contamination, you're more likely to have babies with birth defects. And I apologize for the graphic image, but I want you to see what some of those birth defects are. And this isn't my work. This is a study showing if you're exposed to atrazine in utero, you're more likely to have gastrothesis, where the baby's born with intestines on the outside of the body. You're more likely to have a baby with coanal atresia, where the nasal and oral cavities don't close up. You're more likely to have babies with genital malformations that we know are associated with low testosterone and high estrogen. Hypospadias, where the urethra doesn't go all the way through the penis. Cryptorchidism, where the testicles don't descend. And microphallus, where the penis doesn't grow. The EPA has finally acknowledged there's a problem with atrazine, and they said, quote, a monetary value is assigned to disease, impairments, and shortened lives and weighed against the benefits of keeping a chemical in use. They're saying, we know it does stuff, but somebody makes money on it. The EPA said that. Here's what else I've learned in my state now. I've been here 28 years. We're the fifth largest economy in the world. If California were its own country, we'd be the fifth richest country in the world. Not because of Hollywood, not because of tech, but because of agriculture. One in 10 jobs, 30% of the land, 350 agricultural products come from California. And I didn't notice 50%, half of the United States' food comes from California. We use more pesticides than any other state, and 90% of the workers are Latinx. Here are the top 10 counties for agriculture in California. These are the 10 counties then that make us the fifth richest country in the world. Where do you think the 30 poorest towns are in California? So the people who make us the fifth largest economy in the world are the targets of chemicals that we know are associated with adverse health outcomes. That's a lot for a little boy who likes frogs to deal with. You can imagine that they changed their name after 2000. I think they should have spelled it with an I instead of a Y, but they don't listen to me. You can imagine they were upset. They, they, I almost said tortured. They harassed me, my family. They tried to destroy my career, and they denied it. They did stuff that was so outrageous. I think their goal was that if I talked about it, I would look crazy and somebody would lock me up. That part still might be true. <laughs> they told New Yorker Magazine, for example, that it was, wasn't true. Their spokesperson says, I am troubled by a suggestion that we have ever tried to discredit anyone. Our focus has always been on communicating the science and setting the record straight. I am troubled. They have never tried to discredit anyone. Well, they lost a $110 million lawsuit a couple years ago. CSA has filed under seal, and all their secret papers and documents about Tyrone became public. Look at the first thing under their science strategy. Discredit AIDS. Where on earth would I have gotten the idea that they didn't like Tyrone. <laughs> I'm ending. I'm ending on this for a reason. I'm ending on this because you will face times, I guarantee you, when something in your life may be holding you back. Hopefully it's not a multi-billion dollar industry. Could be your institution. Could be a jealous neighbor. This was just in the paper this morning. Could be a White House that doesn't seem like they appreciate you. But when those times come, you must remember who your people are. Whether it's your fam family, or your lab family, or your Sockness family, you must remember who your people are. And you must remember that when you get, you give. Otherwise, the whole system breaks down. There's no way I would have made it through these 20 years without my people. You will find, and I guarantee you, especially if you're a woman, especially if you're an immigrant, especially if you're a person of color, especially if you're first generation, that even with your people around you, sometimes the biggest thing holding you back is yourself. Self-doubt. They got a lot of fancy words for it. Stereotype threat, imposter syndrome. Regardless of the word they use, if you don't know what I'm talking about, trust me, you will. I'm 50 years old. I've been doing this for 30 years. I still feel it. And it's at those times that you have to find your confidence. In fact, you have to find more than your confidence. It's at those times that you have to get attitude. So when they ask me, what music do you want to walk up here with? I chose 50 Cent. <laughs> and I chose 50 Cent. I chose 50 Cent because he said it way better than I ever could.